Diversidad Iberoamericana and the North American Initiative for Cultural Diplomacy to the presentation of the book Nelson Rockefeller and the Art Diplomacy in Latin America by Andrea Matallana. I am very grateful to everyone for their presence here today, especially to the author of the book, Andrea Matallana, who is professor in the Department of History and Social Studies at Torcuato Luca de Ditela in Universidad, um, sorry, in Buenos Aires, Argentina. I also welcome the members of our panel today, Amelia Santiago, research professor in the Department of History at Universidad Iberoamérica, Iberoamericana, Jeffrey Brisson from the Department of Cultural Studies at Queen's University in Canada, and Cesar Villanueva, research professor at the Department of International Studies at Universidad Iberoamericana. Matayana deals in her book with the cultural policy leads by Nelson Rockefeller based on two major actions, the exhibition and collection of works of art from Latin American countries with the intention of building a North American vision of Latinos. Along the same line, the book focuses on studying the logic, strategies and challenges that arose in the mission carried out by US agents to keep their actions in line with the idea of good neighborhood. Andrea will give us a brief presentation of her book, and then um, we will give the floor to the members of the panel. At the end of the session, we will open a space for questions, so please, uh, you can use the Q&A button at the, at the bottom of the screen to make any questions and comments about the book. Dear Andrea, I give you the floor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, well, um, I feel very, very, a little nervous, you know, because this is the first time that I want to uh, speak in public uh, in front of uh, colleagues about my book. This is my first presentation. The, the presentation in Argentina will be next month in April. Uh, so, and also I feel a little nervous because I had to talk about my book in English. So, well, I will try to do my best. I want to thank Cesar for the invitation. And also uh, I want to say uh, thank you, Guadalupe, for having me here this afternoon for me. Uh, and of course, it's a pleasure to share my presentation with uh with Jeffrey and Amelia, uh, who will um, comment uh, some aspect of my book. I'm, I'm sure that they will be more, um, they will have more information about Nelson Rockefeller and art uh, because they are specialists in, 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 in other points of view about this guy and uh, his family. Uh, so um, I want to say a, a little things about my book. Um, the book is the result of uh, my research between 2016 to 2019. For this research, I received a, a grant from a Terra Foundation for American Arts and also uh, I received help from Fulbright Commission. Uh, I, I was a, a research fellow in University of California at Davis. And also I received help from Argentina Ministry of Science. My purpose um, was to analyze how the United States built a relationship with Latin American countries during the Second World War. Um, so, um, and also wanted to explain how this relationship acquired the form of cultural diplomacy or soft power. In addition, I analyzed some aspects of the so-called good neighbor policy during the presidency of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, a little things about the context or, or about the historical context. I was interested in the in the in the in how the United States uh, had tried to approach to South America during the Second World War, and two fundamental um, topics characterized this decade: uh, the economic crisis and the rise of Nazism in Europe. 
um, Nazi presence in South America uh, was one of the main concern of the United States government in those years. I decided to focus on one of the, of the North American government office that uh, was created in the late 30s, the Office for the Coordination of Inter-American Affairs, the OCAA. Two dimensions uh, interested me. Uh, the first was, was um, Nelson Rockefeller appointed uh, as head of that office without any previous political experience. And the other dimension that I found interesting was the size and the responsibilities of that office. Um, young Nelson, who was uh, 32 years old at that time, uh, built a huge structure that in my book is mentioned as um, ideological factory, la usina ideologica. Um, for me, this meant hundreds of people worked to carry out public relationships, um, diplomacy, advertising, and espionage. Um, what backgrounds did Nelson have to get that position? Well, <laughs> this is difficult to explain because no doubt family play an important role. His mother, Abby Rockefeller, was one of the MoMA's founders, and she was an important patron of the contemporary American artist. Abby's arts and interest um, influence in, in Nelson, and with time, uh, Nelson became uh, the president of MoMA in 1938. MoMA is the Museum of Modern uh, Art. Um, the other family background that, from my point of view, uh, helped him to get the job was money. In 1940, Nelson donated $3.4 million to an, an emergency uh, fund of executive branch in the government of the United States. And then Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the president, appointed him uh, to the OCIA, the OCIA, by decree. And there was a lot of criticism in Congress due to the Roosevelt decision. And, and I think it, this was because Nelson was an, an outsider of the uh, Washington circle. Um, for different reasons, probably one of them uh, being his own experience working for the company, uh, for the family company, Nelson Rockefeller thought that art uh, was a fundamental way to build a better understanding of the local societies. He knew Latin America quite well and was convinced that business uh, would improve if he showed interest in the culture and customs where the company uh, had a presence. Um, proof of this um, is the 20th Century uh, of Mexican Art exhibition held at MoMA in the 30s. The show was arranged after Nelson paid a visit to President Cárdenas in Mexico in the middle of the conflict over the oil nationalization. He convinced Franklin Delano Roosevelt to delve into this cultural strategy and the president agree and create the office. I think I am not sure my, my, my wait, wait a minute, please. I'm sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you, okay, yeah. My PowerPoint is in Spanish because some of us speak in Spanish, so. Okay, um, well, 
And at the beginning of the 1940s, Rockefeller um, summoned uh, to the office uh, some of his friends and an acquaintance, uh, as well as a specialist uh, from MoMA, uh, the Museum of Whitney, um, the Smithsonian Institutions, and also uh, he, he called people from entertainment industry, for example, the RKO, uh, and all these people uh, be part of this kind of American challenge. Um, some of these projects uh, to get friends in South America are well known. Let's mention a Walt Disney visit in 1941 to Peru, Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, and Chile. The other well-known experience was Orson Welles travel to Brazil to make a documentary. It was a project full of extravagances, and especially when Orson, while drunk, generate scandals in the night in Rio, in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, in the field of art, there were uh, a particular and intricate linkages between the office, um, the MoMA, and the circles of artists and intellectuals from the East Coast, you know, New York and the East Coast in the United States. Um, from my point of view, uh, the OCAA developed two strategies. First of all, uh, exportation. Hmm? Uh, the office organized an exhibition where some of the most influential and contemporary American artists participate. Some of Nelson friends were part of the project, for example, Alfred Barr, the director of the MoMA, Lincoln Kirstein, the founder of New York Ballet, Edward Barber or Morgan, uh, Monroe Wheeler, um, they were friends from the university. Um, the OCAA promoted the exhibition named Contemporary American Art. The exhibition was divided in three sections and the show traveled all along uh, South American countries. In general terms, uh, the paintings show the idea of American progress urban environments, the strength of, the, of work. And of course, some, uh, some pictures shows uh, cosmopolit cosmopolitanism. No? Uh, most of the artworks came from MoMA, Whitney, and private galleries from New York cultural circles, connected, direct or not, with Abby, to, to Nelson Rockefeller and Abby, his mother. There were many unexpected circumstances, uh, as for example, the fact that the catalog, the first catalog was not written in Spanish or Portuguese. Almost nobody from the delegation spoke Spanish and most of the OCAA team had vaguely any knowledge about South American culture. For some members uh, of the delegation, the tour resulted in a cultural clash. They didn't know the language, the customs, uh, the rules of the neighboring societies, and many ended up exhausted by the weather, the altitude, the accommodation conditions and the lack of communication. Uh, there is a lot of examples um, in letters uh, that some of the, um, uh, the people sent to Nelson Rockefeller telling the whole disaster of the accommodations in cities as um, Buenos Aires or Montevideo or in Peru and Lima, etc. The second uh, strategy that I analyzed was collecting. And from my point of view, it had two main characters that I believe were 
essentially in building a fluid relationship with South America. The first was Grace Morley, the director of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Somebody from the West Coast, um, she was uh, one of the most important uh, specialists in Latin American art in the United States. And uh, she was the only one of the curator who spoke Spanish fluently. My book, uh, vindicate her because she was the one who expressed genuine interest in creating lasting cultural relationships and willingness to know artists and their work. Uh, and, and she wanted to know the, the world of the artist, the culture of these artists. Um, even though she made an excellent work that linked artists and galleries from Latin America to North America, when the OCAA began the preparation for the Latin American art exhibition, uh, a, a big exhibition will be held in MoMA, uh, Nelson decided to send Lincoln Kirsten to South America instead, not Grace Morley. Why him? He had already been in South America with the Ballet Caravan in 1941, but he didn't speak Spanish or Portuguese, and he was not an specialist in Latin American art or colonial art. So, why him? And this was a most interesting idea for me. In my opinion, because in 1942, United States uh, had entered in the world, Rockefeller was pursued of the importance of having first-hand information about the advance of the Nazis in Latin America. Nelson and Lincoln Kirsten were, was were very close friends. So Nelson needed to send a person of his extreme confidence to control Washington diplomacy and to took and look for reliable information about the situation. That is uh, when, from my point of view, the diplomacy of art became espionage. Um, the result of Lincoln Kirsten, um, the, the, the Lincoln Kirsten task um, and travel was not very satisfactory, neither for the espionage nor for the art. Uh, he sent uh, reports uh, from the most diverse sources, employees of embassies and consulate who reinforced or or confronted the point of view of their chief, member of intellectual and artistic circles with whom he interacted and who expressed a very general opinion about the political situation. Um, in Brazil, for example, he obtained details and worrying reports from a uh, vice consul on the conflictive situation with German spies. Some of his reports are very hilarious, I can say. His arrangement for the purchase of artworks was very arbitrary as, as was his opinion on the quality of Latin American art. In Buenos Aires, for example, Kirsten practically left uh, Emilio Petoruti. He was a very important artists in Argentina and in South America also. Uh, he left Petoruti out of the exhibition because somebody said that Petoruti was a fascist. In fact, he knew of Petoruti relationship with Margarita Sarfati, an intellectual fascist. The relationship 
was in the in the beginning of the 1930 and this was enough reason to expel Petoruti from the list of artists um, and I say that well at the end of the war Nelson continued in the office and in 1945 he had a very important uh, role and much criticized participation in the Chapultepec conference uh, in favor of including Argentina, despite considering Perón, who was part of the government in Argentina, uh, a fascist. Nelson tried to put Argentina and make great effort to put Argentina in Chapultepec conference. Um, upon uh, Russell's death, uh, President Truman quickly placed him in another position. And with the time, um, the interest on Latin American art and, and the money, the funds, uh, fade. The, the policy of cultural cooperation will be resented in the, in the, in the 60s with the organization of new government agencies under the umbrella of the Alianza para el Progreso. But if you're lucky enough uh, to go to MoMA, it is an interesting exercise to understand the collection of Latin American art, in fact, inaugurated in 1943, as the result of a political strategy of the United States government to have friends uh, in South America and to secure allies in, in the framework uh, of the World War II. Well, this is the, the main idea uh, about my book and I will pass the, the, the button to Jeffrey or, or Amelia who surely have uh, some new ideas to to give us and put in relationship with my book. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Should I take over or? Okay. <laughs> Hi. I will then. <laughs> Hi, every, every, everybody. My name is Jeffrey Bryson. I'm a professor of history and director of cultural studies at Queen's University in Canada. And I'm speaking to you today from the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples in Kingston, Ontario. I'm a founding member of the North American Cultural Diplomacy Initiative, NACTI, a research group that I share with Eduardo, Cesar, and Guadalupe and, Lupe, and several others in the virtual room I can see in the audience. Um, we in NACTI aim to advance new scholarship and research into how cultural diplomacy and cultural relations operate in the past and present. I'd like to thank, thank the organizers of this panel, my fellow panelists, and all of you in the audience in the workshop group uh, for, uh, for having me here. And I apologize as I did in the pre-meetings for my, my uh, unilingual langu language skills. All of you have to communicate in English because of me and that's not, that's not right, but I appreciate it. So thank you very much for, for your patience with me and, um, and if, uh, if anybody in the audience is asking questions, uh, I'm sure somebody will be able to help me understand too. And I hope, I hope that goes the other way. Um, before, I have kind of a prepared script, but I, but I wanted to say, listening to uh, Amelia there, um, I think, I suspect I'm here because of my expertise in what I see as a fairly analogous, but also very different um, relationship involving the Rockefeller. My work is about the Rockefeller Foundation and also Rockefeller family members, not, not primarily Nelson, although I do know uh, not as much as uh, Elia does, but I do know quite a bit about Ro Nelson Rockefeller and his later, later political career. Um, but I think I'm here because I, I, I look at the Rockefeller Foundation, Rockefeller philanthropy in terms of uh, a privately driven cultural diplomacy and cultural relationship 
between Canada and the United States in, in, in exactly the same period. Uh, it's, it's interesting to me and much of what I'm going to say, I'll try to preview a little bit of what I do because I suspect most people uh, don't, know, don't know about my work. So I'll briefly explain what, what it is that I do and I'll speak just a little bit about how I see it analogous. Uh, but to give away my own punchline before I get into the, into, into the, into the mini kind of comment talk, um, the relationships are of course very different. Canada, when uh, Professor Madalena spoke of the differences and the ignorance, uh, quite frankly, of the Rockefeller team. And, and you know, this is at the time, supposedly the most sophisticated of American culture, culture people, but the absolute ignorance of Latin America at the very moment when they're trying to build a relationship. Um, in Canada, the Canadian and American relationship uh, it's, of course, is fundamentally different. It's often spoke as a, as a special relationship to very, very similar, probably to people, most people in this audience, you probably think of us as fairly synonymous. I, I hope you don't. We Canadians don't think of ourselves as, as like Americans or the same. But, you know, in, in, in broad strokes, we're both British settler societies uh, in Canada, a stronger uh, French element. But, but British settler societies, we're primarily English speaking. Uh, with a French a French language fact, um, and Americans Americans coming to Canada to um, to investigate and to establish a cultural relationship in the 1930s and 40s and 50s, and to spend money as the Rockefeller Foundation did. Those people would have been far more comfortable and uh, and and in, in their skin, comfortable in their skin, comfortable feeling like they were speaking to people who shared sort of fundamental uh, realities. And in, in, in many cases, I was actually surprised in my research, um, there were times when Canadian intellectuals and scholars say, said, these Americans don't get us, but very, very rarely and vice versa. It's so I think, and so that what, what the Rockefeller Foundation and Rockefeller Philanthropy was trying to do with Canada at the, at the time was in some ways a mirror image, I'm gonna use that term again, of what uh, Professor Madalena is talking about in many ways so different. It was about establishing a cultural relationship, but it was building on a, on a solid, on a foundation that of language, of same language, of, um, of same uh, colonial experience and, and really of a permeable, border that we talk about a lot in Canada and the United States. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go back a little bit on script here. I'll start by saying that I was really intrigued and really pleased when Cesar asked me to join this panel on, uh, on Professor Madalena's uh, book, new book. As I read Madalena's work in translation, I confess I don't read Spanish, although I could read the PowerPoints. And as I read more about her work, I felt like what she said about Nelson Rockefeller's deployment of art and culture in Latin America during the Second World War era, both in his personal and family philanthropy, and in his, in his position as coordinator of U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt's Office of Inter-American Affairs, um, and how she discerned the emergence of what I, I describe, I don't know if we can talk about this later, is, is almost a Rockefellerian a Rockefeller cultural foreign policy, a cultural and public diplomacy, soft power campaign engineered to improve hemispheric relationships between the United States and the nations of South and Central America in the years around World War II. I was struck by how all of this felt very much like um, looking in a mirror image of work, of work that I did on cultural and academic programs of the Rockefeller Foundation and of the Carnegie Corporation in New York, of New York and Canada from the 20s and 1950s, and how these also created something akin to a private capital elite network, foreign cultural policy, a non-state version of cultural and knowledge diplomacy. To me, in both cases, as I listened to Professor uh, Madalena and as I read, read her work, um, I saw very different campaigns, but what I kept thinking is this is, uh, a foreign policy that's that's driven. It's not not running against the state, and it and Nelson Rockefeller's 
uh, position. He had a state position, but it's a it's an intermingling of the of the Rockefeller family fortune and the power that gave. And, and Professor Madalena spoke of the doors that opened for for Rockefeller in Latin America. The same thing happens in Canada in in very different ways. But that that money speaks, and and um, I'm going to try to give a brief, brief over view of how that worked in Canada in a similar period. Um, so I'll try to give you a short on high account of my work. Uh, I do so because I think that what I see as a Rockefeller in foreign policy and public and diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis the United States relationship with its northern neighbor, neighbor Canada uh, resonates so well with what we just heard about uh, from Professor Madalena and a Rockefeller foreign policy and diplomacy in Latin America. To me, the connection goes uh, between our research and the subject matter goes far beyond the historical specificities of the Second World War period of American philanthropy and the collective biography of the Rockefeller family. Uh, to me, in addition to all of these very important issues, it speaks directly to culture's role in global relations um, in this very specific period, but I think much, much more broadly, and of, of quite frankly, of capital's role in, in global cultural relations. Uh, my my work also deals with a critical uh, well, deals with a critical role played by Rockefeller and Carnegie philanthropy in the design of Canadian culture from the 1920s to the late 1950s. Specifically, I examine the impact of Rockefeller and Carnegie philanthropy in the development of Canadian universities, colleges, academic research councils, galleries, and museums, and how these American foundations funded Canadian artists and scholars at a time when there was little alternative forms of support and certainly very little of the kind of public sector support, state support that Canadian scholars and artists benefit from today. In the 1930s up until the 1950s, the federal state support for culture and academia that we're now, I think, rightfully proud of uh, didn't exist. It, schools and, and art organizations, museums, galleries replied, relied pretty much on pub, private funding. And there wasn't a lot of that, obviously, in the 1930s and the Great Depression, but even, even through the war period and after. And my work explained how the American private foundations changed all that, playing a crucial role in the political economy of Canadian culture from the late 1920s to the early war, uh, years of the Cold War an impact that is still seen in the way we Canadians organize our culture to this day. I'll cut to the chase and tell you about the impact of American philanthropy and its support in Canada during these years. In a direct sense, Canadian universities, galleries, museums, artists, and intellectuals benefited from the influx of upwards of $20 million to Canada's cultural and academic economies in those three decades. American philanthropic support allowed scholars to do their research, to publish their work, artists to practice and exhibit in, in a professional sense, and most critically, it integrated Canadian cultural and academic practitioners into continental cultural and academic networks. I think that that's the big, in the same way that uh, Professor Madalena speaks of the Latin American experience and the trying, the trying to, I think in, in your case, trying to play catch up in a relationship that, that didn't have such solid grounding. The American-Canadian relationship uh, and the impact of, uh, of American philanthropy, primarily the, of Rockefellers and Carnegie, uh, was about integrating Canadian networks and individuals and institutions into American ones, and then more broadly into a, a global, uh, a Western liberal international. But it was about it was about bringing Canadians into uh, and, and I, I should say an American dominated system uh, of cultural infrastructure. Um, in a sense, the relationship to the Rockefeller Foundation, the Carnegie Corporation, brought Canadians and their institutions into cultural networks that really bridged the Canadian American political border, even at times rendering that border as invisible or at least extremely permeable. I think even more significant than the direct financial impact in this networking, however, was that with the money came leadership and direction. The money in short came with strings attached. 
And this is where I think probably the situations are much, much more uh, analogous uh, between Latin America. The, the, uh, the importance of American capital in cultural funding and, and, and then the leadership and the direction and, and the dominance that it exerted, I think, I mean, I, I know about the Canadian case was really, really important. It in some ways was responsible for the countervailing rise of the state of state support for culture in Canada to push away from the, the dependence on the American market driven forces. Uh, what I argue is that the greatest overall impact of private American investment in Canadian culture was that the leaders of American foundations essentially taught leading Canadian artists and intellectuals and in the Canadian federal state even how to organize Canadian cultural and intellectual resources from the Great Depression to the early years of the Cold War. So when the Canadian state establishes its own publicly funded cultural infrastructure, its own support for higher education, its own support for research in the social sciences and the humanities, uh, it did so on models really built by the American foundations in the 30s and 40s and 50s. Uh, and, and the Canadian state, in a, in a twist of irony, took its lead from the American foundations. Uh, so that leadership not only was a temporary in a, in a time of need for Canadian culture, but it, it has a permanent Im, input impact on the shaping of Canadian culture subsequently. Um, so I'm, why does all this matter to all of us as students of cultural, culture and knowledge diplomacy, which is what I would call it? Um, uh, most critically, like Professor Madalena's work on the Rockefeller program in Latin America, my work in, on Canada speaks to a relationship between nations and peoples, which is not simply a story about how nation states interact in the formal arenas of international relations. It's paralleling that. Um, it, I think that when you look at American philanthropy, either individual and the, and the power of such individuals as Nelson Rockefeller and, and his family, when you look at that kind of soft and hard power and uh, its intersection with state relations, you, you get a, a much broader view of, of things like cultural diplomacy and cultural relations and, uh, and see a trans and even supranational political a supranational political economy of culture that at times, at different times, parallels, diverges, and often intersects and works with formal state to state relations. And, and again, when I get back to where the focus should be on Professor Madalena's work, uh, I, I see that so directly. Nelson Rockefeller is working as a state, if you will, operative, a state official, working for the United States as a formal. Uh, not not so much a diplomat, but a formal uh, official in another country doing diplomatic work. But he's also working on behalf of himself and his family as a, as an artist, as an art patron, as a cultural patron, as somebody who who by very nature of his extreme wealth, uh, based on a monopoly in oil and petrol uh, petroleum standard oil, is uh, can really lead uh, or or try to lead other other nations and other peoples and how they, they view art and the significance of this or that art, artistic. Um, Professor Madalena's new book thus points to the significance of the role of culture and how nations and peoples interact. And I'd like to think that research like ours also contributes to that scholarship that addresses the importance of private sector networks of power, of non-governmental actors working with the state and uh, sometimes against the state, but often, and um, and of the, the power of uh, monopoly capital uh, that that gave rise to the Rockefeller Foundation, the Carnegie Corporation in more recent years, the Ford Foundation, and of course of uh, much more recent philanthropic capitalists like the Gates, uh, uh, Chan, Zuckerberg, and Bezos. So thank you very much, and again, I appreciate being on this panel, and I'm looking forward to being able to participate in a lively discussion of uh, Professor Madalena's uh, great. No, and I hand no, off no. to Amelia. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Amelia Chavez Santiago. I got a PhD in cultural history 
Uh, at the moment, my field of studies is the uh, Mexican uh, cultural policies in the 50s. Um, I was very uh, interested in different issues uh, about the book because I wrote a small presentation about the, some topics I noticed. Okay, I'm very grateful uh, doc, uh, for Dr. Mat Matayana, Dr. Villanueva and Dr. Brisson for inviting to me uh, to give my comment on this interesting and excellent book which is necessary to learn about issues uh, that refer the art and politics, as well as the art as a cultural tool that helped establish alliances between American countries during the years of World War II. In the same way, uh, this book is an important study that helps us to see the result of the exhibition in America and the consolidation of American contemporary art in the 50s, already at the beginning of the Cold War. Uh, this book is the result of an extensive and nourished investigation that takes place during the first half of the 40s. Uh, we're question um, of cultural policies and diplomatic action of the exhibition sent to Latin America by the philanthropics and the public official Nelson Rockefeller and the Office of Inter-American Affairs of the United States government, which he coordinates. Uh, as Andrea Matallana indicates, uh, the establishment of Buena Voluntad relation by the United States was a new issue for Latin America countries because since the beginning of the 20th century, the United States government had applied the policy known as the big stick, El Gran Garrote, which considered of interventionism and the imposition of political and economic action with the neighboring countries. Uh, returning to the then of the office of uh, of the office of the Inter-American Affairs, this was made up of a group of cultural mediators uh, who uh, participate in an important exhibition that traveled in different Latin America countries, which was contemporary North America painting. The purpose of the exhibition was to create an image of America art from the South America public. And at the same time, uh, with the, vis the, the visit of the exhibition in, a various co in, in, in diverse countries, the Museum of Modern Art MoMA was able to collect a fairly large and important set of Latin American art, uh, which was exhibited in the museum's facilities in, in 1943. I believe that this sample for Latin American art that was present at a MoMA corresponds to one of the fear efforts to try to gather contemporary works from various countries of America, preceded uh, by many years to what the Sao Paulo Biennale uh, will seek, uh, seek the present from the time it was inaugurated in 1951. Mm. When reading uh, Dr. Andrea Matallana's book, the name of important cultural agents who participate in the exhibition, contemporary North American painting, are found. Among the main ones, of course, uh, that of Nelson Rockefeller stand out, but also that of Grace Morley, Muse, who uh, she was a museum director, an expert in her field, and a deep connoisseur, connoisseur of Mexican art. Uh, who was sent to South America as an intermediary to identify the spaces uh, where the exhibition will be present and to establish cooperative ties between artists, gallery owners, collectors, and museum directors. An antecedent that marks the author with respect to the impulse that the United States gave the exhibition of mutual recognition is the exhibition 20 Centuries of Mexican Art held at uh, MoMA in uh, 1940, which gave excellent results um, from my opinion of view. I believe that it uh, like the foundation to promote the exchange of exhibition between countries as a meeting point and cultural recognition in the American continent. 
Another element uh, that draws my attention in this book, and it is, uh, it is something that the author highlights, is that the exhibition Contemporary North America Painting only had, uh, only had figurative painted belonging the different pictor pictorial uh, tendencies were exhibited. And only a few uh, that they correspond to abstract expressionism, which was an original pictorial trend in the United States and was getting strange in the uh, 40s through the work of artists known as the New York School. Uh, return to the issue of figuration in the works is clear. Uh, they were close, they were choose, chosen the figurative painting because they tried to educate, uh, to educate and make notes through representation of reality to the cities, the lifestyle of the working middle class, and how they spend their free time. In conclusion, I would like to, to retain that this book is a clear example for a meticulously carried on investigation that require the consultation of archives and emerography located in different and perhaps distant places. The book, Nelson Rockefeller and the Diplomacy of Art in America, of Art in Latin America, is an open door to a complex and exciting landscape that, when observed, uh, leads us to ask ourselves more about the exhibition plans and imagine for a specific public. Um, public. The reception of those public and the response of the art critics, and as well as the logistics between museums and the transfer of work across a continent to establish an alliance during the years of promoting a Pan Americanism. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amalia. I'm going to take it from here. Guadalupe, I was a little bit late from the beginning. I, I excuse myself for that. And uh, I am probably one of the happiest uh, persons in this uh, room because uh, for, for me, the idea of uh, this uh, North American Cultural Diplomacy Initiative that I belong to uh, is precisely to connect uh, people with the uh, cultural interests around the topics of diplomacy, of uh, cultural exchanges, um, visions related to museums, to collections, to but also to uh, exchanges of uh, people at all levels. So when I see this happening, Andrea Matallana from Argentina in 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 the south of uh, Latin of, of the Americas, and then Jeffrey Brisson speaking from uh, Toronto in Canada, and then having Amelia responding also to this from Mexico. I think the whole purpose of NACDI as uh, it's established precisely meets its best form, which is trying to connect people from all different places coming together to engage in a dialogue. It is also a very nice and gentle gesture from all of you to decide to speak in English, uh, a lot, uh, mentioning what just Jeffrey said. Uh, let, let's not have language as a barrier, but as a connector uh, in, in which we can actually exchange ideas. Uh, it could have been, and it will be certainly another opportunity to discuss the book in Spanish, or in, uh, in any other language. But at the moment, I'm very, very happy that part of the objective of NAGDI is being fulfilled here. All of these um, uh, recent uh, commentators, both Amelia, no, Amelia, Jeffrey, and Andrea, they have so many interesting things in common. And um, they, are, they are all interested in how uh, art collections, how um, influence of powerful people, how cultural policies, cultural diplomacies, diplomacies are set up to actually uh, communicate values, to communicate identities, to communicate 
products of art among different countries. Andrea's book, which I finished yesterday, by the way, Andrea, I, I spent part of yesterday's reading the last part of the book, the, uh, the sixth chapter, El Imperio Informal. So I have to say that the, the book is really a, a good meditation uh, in relation to geopolitics uh, of the time when one thing that you mentioned, and I want to stress that very firmly, the idea of the Rockefeller empire to come to Latin America at that time was in part through the real and imagined threats that they perceived of the uh, Soviet Union in relation to communism expanding in, in the Americas. So they really wanted, had a geopolitical agenda in relation to the expansion of other ideologies and they wanted to have a censorship there. So spying, which is something that we don't often talk about in relation to cultural diplomacy, is another of the angles of this phenomenon, of this practice, which is not always talked about. But also empire, uh, this idea of America for the Americans, uh, based on the Monroe Doctrine, which is basically being received in Latin America as an imperialist a claim in relation that no other country except the United States should have anything to say about uh, politics, economics, or culture in the Americas. So they wanted to make sure that this idea of, of their own uh, empire, their, their own idea of their colonial mission in the world were secured by having all these exchanges. So culture was a means to procure both geopolitical agendas, but also uh, imperialistic agendas in the region. So that's, in that, it, it, there is something there that I feel tremendously close to what you say, because that path has not been ended. Now, there are many other ways and many other filters, but to some extent, we are still caught up in the idea that um, we have to have recognition from the North in order to be secure ourselves in the South. And I think we must be aware of that to try to change that uh, flow in, in different ways. So uh, I really congratulate you, Andrea, for, for the book you have produced. I really want to emphasize also that the work of Jeffrey connects really to the point with you. Uh, Jeffrey wrote a book uh, in 2005 published by McKeel and Queen's University called Rockefeller, Carnegie and Canada, American Philanthropy and the Arts and Letters. And he has a collection of different publications related to this. So I really want this to be the beginning of a good uh, communication uh, between all of you. So the, the connection with the Rockefeller and cultural diplomacy remains. And I want to say also about Amelia, uh, she just uh, finished her PhD. I was uh, really honored to be in the committee a month and a half ago. She received honors. And as you see, she's really well known. Uh, she's really an expert in the uh, cultural policies, not just in Mexico, but in, in the region. She knows a lot of the people, she knows who is who. And she's been working very closely with the uh, representation of Mexico in the uh, Venice Biennale. Uh, so I think the three of you are such a match. You should continue your dialogue. This is just the beginning. And I'm extremely happy for, for that. Finally, I want to thank Guadalupe and Universidad uh, Panamericana for having organized this uh, wonderful event. Really thank you, Guadalupe, from the um, Maestria and Studios de Gestión Cultural that you direct. I really feel very happy that you could host this and help us with, with the ideas. Having said that, uh, I really it's two o'clock and I really want to open the microphone for whoever wants to mention uh, anything. And I have to say that I see in the audience uh, I, I know many, many of you in there, 
And I'm really happy because most of you are people with a lot of um, expertise in the area of cultural diplomacy and history in, the, in this region. Thank you for joining and uh, for being here with us. And precisely Edgardo writes a, a question or a comment uh, related to this. Uh, I read it. He says that there are currently at least four Mexicans running major museums in the United States. We have also an international recognized Mexican artist like Rafael Lozano living in Canada. We have not taken advantage of their presence to build new bridges with them through cultural diplomacy. Establishing a dialogue with them could be an upcoming objective for NAVI. Thank you very much, Edgardo. We are preparing the third summit, which will take place at the end of May. And this is a very good opportunity to think about it and try to uh, bring these uh, people into the conversation. Soila also makes a comment. Thank you for this interesting presentation. It would be interesting to perhaps present the book at the Centro Mexicano de Filantropia. We are all open for that. I'm sure Andrea will be happy to, to hear about it. So please keep in touch, Soila. Uh, of course, sure. Know, thank you. Thank you very much for all the comments. I think we lost you, Andrea, for a second. <laughs> Are you there, Andrea? She will join probably in a, in a, in a moment. I, it's Here okay. It's, it's a problem with my connection, I think. My connection no, no, are no. unstable. Okay, okay. Um, I, I don't know if you have any question because I want to uh, I want to say two little uh, and specific um, commentaries. One is about the fear um, of Nelson Rockefeller and the government on uh, about Nazism and on communism, as you pointed out, uh, Cesar. Um, I don't have an exactly answer, but I have questions about this because, of course, I can understand that they, uh, the government, have a lot of fears about Nazis in Latin America. For example, in Buenos Aires, uh, in I think it was in 1838 or, or, or something, there was one of the of one of the major. Um, in in the Luna Park uh, was one of the Nazi rally uh, in 1938 was one of the biggest outside Germany. 20,000 20, people were there in Buenos Aires. Also, uh, another was in Manhattan. I don't know if you remember in the Madison Square Garden, something like So the same thing happened at the same year almost in Buenos Aires. So they have some point that they were worried about the Nazis in the, in the south of the south of South America, no? And the other thing that is, is, is interesting uh, for me, but I, I have no an answer, is the fear to communism. Because Even though the government had to be worried about it, uh, most of the, of the um, I think uh, Lincoln Kirstein uh, preferred to get in touch with artists who were uh, part of the Communist Party in South America or were part of the Popular Front in South America. As uh, of course, uh, Siqueiros, um, Rivera, but also Bernie in Buenos Aires or, or Andrade in Brazil. So I am not sure that if Lincoln Kirsten um, probably, I don't know how information had Nelson Rockefeller, but I don't know if they are really aware that these people uh, were part of uh, a communist party. 
And in fact, um, I think it was Siqueiros uh, who, uh, Lincoln Kirsten tried to ask protection uh, for Siqueiro because Siqueiro was working in Chile uh, after they, I think they tried to kill um, Trotsky or something, or he was in uh, part of the conspiration. So I don't know if Lincoln Kirsten, as a representative of the OCAA, realized that they are um, uh, keeping in touch with people who are not, uh, who are not politicians, but were linked with Communist Party in uh, the in Latin America. That is my my two thoughts about uh, this this connection. Jeffrey, maybe you have a comment in relation to that because I'm sure uh, at least a guess, uh, a, a, an educated guess, uh, how this uh, the the mind of people like Rockefeller were in relation to co-opting people from uh, outside their own circles uh, mm -hmm. through the money. Maybe you could uh, elaborate a little bit on that. But I don't know. Yeah, no, you read my mind. I was, I was wanting to. I was politely not jumping in, but and and also in in respect to um, to Professor Madeline, as I, I didn't want to sort of talk about the same things you just talked about because I know that you're you're more of an expert. Um, on the on both sides, really the Rockefeller side and vis-a-vis -vis Latin America, but um, common in, in and I'm sure this is true with your literature too, but common in the Canadian and American historiography on the Rockefeller Foundation and the Rockefellers personally, a, a common story is about um, their fundamental misunderstandings of the Mexican muralist politics. And the kind of ignorant dab. I see Amelia <laughs> react. Maybe I'm wrong, <laughs> or, or maybe you, you have more to say about that. But the, the not really understanding. I think exactly what uh, Professor Madeline has said. Not not really understanding the politics that that was behind the art, or 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 trivializing it in some ways, thinking that it was interesting and maybe safe because it was. It was it was uh, Marxist inspired leftist <laughs> critique in Latin America, maybe not so serious. But then, at times, like there's a celebrated incident, which I think probably if, if all of you know about, about when they when uh, Rivera uh, was commissioned to do a a mural in um, in Rockefeller Center when it was being built, uh, which I think became Lenin leading the masses. And um, I, John D. Jr. and and Nelson walked in and and saw, saw the design and said, no, "That's that's not going to be in our building." You know, the, the idea being that they were they felt like they were fashionably open to left politics, but had no real interest in in uh, in anybody in the heart of their their business en enterprise uh, and in Manhattan. No real interest in anybody engaging in that kind of public diplomacy or really th that would have been a big public diplomacy moment. A Mexican muralist having that kind of uh, uh, power to talk in the center of American capital and culture. But that didn't happen. Uh, it was decommissioned and um, and I think done elsewhere. I think I saw it in Mexico City, the, the resulting mural. Um, so I think I think I overdid the specifics of that question, but I think that there was a, a, a real ignorance um, and arrogance about the politics behind um, behind at least the Mexican muralists. But I'm, I think about the politics of artists uh, really everywhere uh, south of south of the American border, uh, the southern border. So that, that's a thought. I also have a, a more complex answer that I'll save, but the preview to that would be is that they thought their, the Rockefellers and the foundation officers thought that they could mold people in the direction that they wanted to go. Um, and probably that explains why they commissioned Rivera in the first place. They could not have been that ignorant, but they, they thought that their money would speak. And, and it generally did. You see that in much more subtle ways in the Canadian experience where uh, scholars who wanted to do a study were quite willing to propose another study if it meant a big research grant in the same ways that I think a lot of us might still be today 
we we probably don't admit it anymore. But but money did talk uh, in scholarship and in art in in the Canadian experience. So. Okay, thank you very much. Just to say that Jose Maria Serta, a Catalan, was the one commissioned to paint the murals after Rivera's erasement at the Rockefeller Center. And it's a good mural. I, I like the pieces that he made there. Andrea and I were there 10 years ago when we were in New York under a um, scholarship there by the, at the time, studying at NYU. But uh, Rivera managed to get the mural into the National Palace of Fine Arts in Mexico, and we are happy uh, to get it there. M my guess, and I've been reading some about it, is that the Americans had to ponder between fascism, Nazism, the threat versus communism. And it was easier for them to persuade the communists in a way and to, to put money into that not to have them play against them by self. So there is a, a whole critique, I'm sure Amelia knows about it, in relation to not only the Rockefellers, but the Mexican state also co-opted many of the muralists and the leftist uh, intelligentsia in general, painters, writers, dancers, to play along with the state lines to be, have a front against uh, Nazism and fascism, which uh, were presented as a higher threat to the idea of the liberal state at the time. So that's why there's a lot in there from the geopolitics and ideology, as Andrea mentions in her book. Uh, Amelia, would you like to add a final word to this? Uh, yes, thank you. It's, it's important to remember the relationship between the American artists and Mexican artists in the 30s in California and New York. And the influence uh, that uh, between uh, to create uh, a new tendency, for example, the abstract expressionism and the work of, uh, of Orozco, Siqueiros and Rivera in the United States was very important. Absolutely, you bring an excellent point. Not always recognized, by the way, that a lot of the inspiration that got these uh, magnificent paintings by the abstract group, the School of New York, as it ended up being known, uh, was inspired in part by the muralists from Mexico. In fact, many of them work closely with artists in the United States. Not only in Los in, in California, Jackson Pollock, Jackson, which was the Jackson main, the Pollock, main for example. Exactly, exactly. Andrea, you have the last word before we close. Would you like to add a final sentence, a final comment to uh, this? My final comment has to has to um, is related to the idea that they um, these people have about. Um, Latin America on South American art. Maybe I had to separate the muralists from the other artists from South America. And um, unfortunately, um, Lincoln Kirsten at least um, arrived to the, the conclusion that the South American paintings in comparison with North American painting was, uh, was not very good. South American paintings from his perspective was, um, I don't know, weak and simple and European tributary or something like that. And, and this point of, uh, of, the, uh, of the analysis, uh, for me, uh, Grace Morley have uh, a, a, a strong position because she tried to defend the the South American artists and the South American culture. No, uh, Kirsten every time was com a, a comparison in comparison with uh, a, a, in, in a way that a North American uh, painter were uh, better quality had better quality than South American uh, painters and Grace Morley. 
um, who was the real uh, specialist in art and who who were not a um, friend of Rockefeller. In fact, uh, she made a, a strong contribution in, in favor of the South American paintings and, and the originality of South American paintings. So, and I think it's interesting that the nationalistic point of view of the people from Rockefeller and the um, ethnocentric, I think, point of view uh, in comparison with uh, South America. So this is my last uh, idea that I want to point here. Uh, let me add a little layer there because you say it is your own idea, but you don't express it as such. Perhaps now that we are very much interested in analyzing also how gender plays a role in decision making, uh, the role of race, she being the expert, but not being a man, close yeah. to the power there, those relationships in the 40 were very important. So there's a gender connection there that maybe yes. the, the more macho attitude of the Rockefeller family and the Rockefeller himself would not allow himself to trust the judgment of a woman, which is a layer there that you could also point out in another conversation. But it's been such a wonderful talk such a wonderful uh, afternoon. I really want to thank you all. And I'll pass it to Guadalupe Moreno, who will close it for us. Uh, again, Guadalupe, thank you for organizing this. It's such a great event. And thank you again to all the three of you for, for your comments and your participation. Guadalupe, please. Thank you, Cesar. We, I am uh, realizing we have a last question in the chat. I, I don't know if you want to address. I think it's very interesting. It's uh, also from Edgardo. And he asked, in recent years, the Broadway musical Evita or movies like Coco or The Emperor's New Groove are somehow the continuity of USA cultural diplomacy strategy in Latin America. And this is a question. Do you think so? Uh, maybe me. Uh, uh, about the question of Edgardo, for me was very interesting because he mentioned the uh, Mexican artist uh, Rafael Lozano Hemmer. And uh, that artist is very important because he, uh, he returned the Mexican pavilion after uh, a long, uh, after a decade to ausent. For example, the, fair, the last Mexican pavilion was, was in 1954, 58, sorry, and decades after returned the Mexican pavilion with Rafael Lozano Hemmer in 2007. And it's very, and for, for that is a very important Mexican artist. Uh, and, and he has now multiple nationalities, one of them is Canadian also. He, he is originally from Mexico, but it's this kind of uh, artist that move along the lines of uh, nations. And he was fundamental precisely to bring back the participation of Mexico in the Biennale. Thank you for reminding us that, Andrea. Jeffrey or Andrea, would you like to say something related to this comment, Andrea? Yes, I, I want to say that um, I, don't, I am not sure that this is, uh, Edgardo said, Coco and Disney uh, movies, et cetera. I, I am not sure that this is part of um, cultural diplomacy, but I am sure that this is part of um, informal empire. No, and you know, the, the, the huge um, companies trying to a uh, resignificant the meaning of the Latin American culture. You know, I, I think I, th these are forms of the informal empire. I am not sure that it's a part of a cultural diplomacy because I, I, I don't see an office or be part of an, a strategy from government, but of course it's part of the global culture and, and this kind of things that the, the huge uh, enterprise from the United States or global uh, companies for movies 
um, doing that with our culture, but also with um, history and Africans and whatever. No, you know, this is a is a, a way to communicate and re-elaborate the, the significance of the culture of the others. Yeah, I'll jump in there too. I think um, once again, I can't say what I'd like to say as well as you did <laughs> right there, but I'm, I'm teaching a, a senior seminar undergraduate course on the, the American century, the concept of the American century. And I, I, we talk every week uh, around the t seminar table that American dominance, uh, political, economic, uh, and uh, such over you know, the end of the Second World War, the end of the Cold War, or maybe a little beyond. And, uh, and there's a lot of, you know, the one thing that I've talked to the students and they seem to agree is that the one area where one can really talk about American hegemony that really, really sticks is in terms of the culture industries and particularly Hollywood. So I think uh, it's a cultural diplomacy if you use that term very, very widely in terms of American interests, American dominated interests projecting uh, an image as, as Professor Madalena just said, um, and appro appropriating uh, peoples elsewhere um, and then projecting uh, misappropriated images <laughs> of those of those cultures. So it would be a, it would be a very twist twisted cultural diplomacy, but it does work in the in the sort of arena of of culture and of diplomacy of relations between people peoples at least in North America these images unfortunately stick um, inaccurate depictions of histories and peoples but that's what you know the people that see these movies think of of those and, and you know hopefully they're not all wrong but I think that they probably are but in any way it's it's a depiction of history that's made for entertainment and uh, and made to to fill the interests and the, the needs of a, of, a, of a select group of primarily American cultural creators. So, so in that sense, I think it's related for sure. Thank you, Jeffrey, again. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you, thank you, Amelia. Guadalupe, you close it, please, thank you. Thank you, Cesar. Well, I just uh, want to say thank you to all of you. Uh, Amelia, thank you for uh, making the, the time to be with us and presenting this very interesting book, especially as Cesar said, at Universidad Panamericana, which have a, a master in cultural policy and arts management. This is a very um, important topic for us, uh, cultural diplomacy and, and art diplomacy. So it's really a, a pleasure to, to have you here. And it's a pleasure to host this um, webinar today in the name of uh, Universidad Panamericana in collaboration with Universidad Iberoamericana and NACDI, the North American Initiative for Cultural Diplomacy, which uh, Jeff is um, uh, one of the founder with, along with Cesar. So thank you very much uh, for giving us the opportunity to host this webinar. Uh, Amelia, it's also a pleasure to, to have you here and all your um, uh, thoughts on, on this uh, topic. Thank you, you all. Thank you for the audience. This uh, webinar will be host at the YouTube channel at Universidad Panamericana. So in case someone miss it, please uh, let them know that they can watch it in, in the YouTube channel. Thank you all. Have a good uh, Friday and weekend. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Gracias, Andrea. Muchas gracias. Saludos. Muchas gracias. Gracias a ustedes. Escribo. Nos vemos pronto. Chao. Sí, gracias ojalá. a todos. Eso. Gracias. Bye bye. Bye bye.